everyone present here. On behalf of CMR University School of Legal Studies, I would like to extend a heartfelt welcome to our respected dignitaries for the National Seminar on Recent Trends in Constitutional Law. The seminar is conducted with an aim to focus on the recent trends in the area and to focus on engaging the participants with constitutional theory and its practical application in framing law and policy in order to realize the constitutional vision in the recent years. I would like to invite Pranav, a student of CMR University School of Legal Studies, to sing the invocation song. Shri Gananatham Satatam Vajayam Shri Adhi Keshava Sodare Salputram Matrahitam Paripalanavalam Shiva Karaharnya Punakunya Janyam Shri Gananatham Subramanya Avaraja Pramukam Mushika Vahana Sadmukha Makaram Ashtadravya Mahavana Priyam Ashtaraga Harase Divinayaka Shri Gananadam Vyasoptika Mahamaya Nadhi Lekitam Siddhi Bhutti Yoga Mangala Dasitam Agastya Munikshana Darpadi Haram Shubhaka Vehi Sreshti Pradakaram Shri Gana Gama Vaisa Gasani Sani Paripama Gama Vaisa Shri Gana Nini Papa Mama Papa Nini Papa Mama Papa Mama Papa Mama Papa Mama Papa Mama Papa Gama 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 Vaisa Nini Papa Mama Mama Gaga Shri Gana Natham Shri Gana Natham Shri Gana Natham Satatham Vajayam Thank you Pranav for blessing our ears with your wonderful song. It was truly mesmerizing. I now request all the dignitaries to kindly light the ceremonial lamp. Thank you. I now request our beloved director, sir, Professor Dr. V.J. Praneshwaran to kindly deliver the welcome address. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of CMR University School of Legal Studies, I extend a very warm welcome to one and all. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome this gathering to the inauguration of this National Seminar on Recent Trends in Constitutional Law. We have amidst us today Justice Ashok G. Nijagannavar, former Judge, High Court of Karnataka, currently Member, Law Commission of Karnataka, who has kindly consented to, to be the Chief Guest and deliver the inaugural address. I deem it my privilege to introduce the Chief Guest on this occasion. Graduated from Karnataka Science College, Darwar, studied LLB in University College of Law Darwad and PG course in the same institution. Further enrolled in the year 1993 on the roles of the Karnataka State Bar Council and joined the chambers of Sri I.G. Kheregowder Advocate. 
started practicing in district and civil courts at Darwad. His lordship has rendered services as legal advisor to several nationalized and cooperative banks, Hubali Darwad Municipal Corporation, New India Assurance Company, Life Insurance Corporation of India, LIC Housing Finance Corporation, Karnataka University, University of Agricultural Sciences, Darwad, and also as honorary lecturer in University College of Law and Purkatli Adja Law College, Darwad. His Lordship joined judicial service as district judge in the year 2002 and elevated as judge High Court of Karnataka in the year 2018 and served till July 2021. At present, serving as member of the Law Commission of Karnataka, Bengaluru. It is indeed a pleasure to have you amidst us, sir. I am sure that the participants will find great inspiration in your words. I request our Dean, Professor Dr. T. R. Subramanya, to present the bouquet to our chief guest. We have amidst us today one of the most highly regarded personalities in legal education, an educator, academician, and administrator, Professor Dr. Ishwar Bhatt, former Vice Chancellor, Karnataka State Law University, Hubali. Prior to this, he was the Vice Chancellor of West Bengal National University Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. He was a Fulbright Nehru Visiting Professor in 2010 and involved in co teaching NPO law at Columbus Law School of Catholic University of America, Washington, D.C. He was also a visiting professor at Queen's University, Kingston, Canada. He was a recipient of Shastri Visiting Research Fellowship in 1992 and research on comparative study of language rights in India and Canada in the universities of York, Toronto and Ottawa. His publications include four authored books, three edited works and 85 research articles in legal journals of international and national repute. He has presented his research work on various national and international forums. His areas of interest include constitutional law, administrative law, law and social change, water law, research methodology, world trade law, intellectual properties law, and NPO law. On behalf of all of us at CMR University School of Legal Studies, I extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. <laughs> I request Admin of the Dr. Subramanya to kindly hand over a bouquet to the guest of honor. We are also immensely delighted to have amidst us Professor Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, the Dean, Faculty of Law, Symbiosis International Deemed University and Director, Symbiosis Law School, Pune. Professor Gurpur's public service commitment is evident in constant engagement in quality improvement in higher education in remote universities, women's education, law schools and with government at the Law Commission of India, resources to National Women's Commission, to the Judicial Academy, and to policy reforms related to sex workers in Karnataka, engagement in law universities, other institutions and in govern governance at the provincial and national level. She has successfully worked at cross-cultural teams in her stints at UAE and Ireland. She has also invited to be a she has, she has been invited to be a member of the International Advisory Board of the Centre for Common Law in Europe, UCD Sutherland School, Ireland. She has been appointed as distinguished member of the editorial board of the Cyber Law University International E-Journal. She was a convener of the recent IALS Global Law Deans Forum at Symbiosis Law School, Pune in November 2017, which brought together national law universities and private schools as co-sponsors for the first time. She has been nominated as a member of the MCC IA Corporate Legislation Committee for 2020-22. She was also invited to speak at the Global Law Justice and Development Week at the World Bank USA. Dr. Gurpur is a recipient of the prestigious Pitru Chandama Award 2019 from the Ministry of Women and Child Development, Government of Karnataka for her contribution to the field of education and women's empowerment. On behalf of all of us at CMR University School of Legal Studies, I extend a very warm welcome to you, Madam. I request our President Dr. to kindly hand over the place to your performance. I also take this opportunity to heartily welcome our Honorable Register, Dr. Praveen, who has been always a constant source of inspiration to all of us here. I now humbly also welcome our Dean, Prof. Dr. T. R. Subramanya, C. 
Sir, your zeal, enthusiasm, and commitment has been a constant source of inspiration to all of us. I also welcome all the distinguished invitees present. I welcome all the dear faculty and participants of, to the inauguration of the National Seminar on the Recent Trends in Constitutional Law. Wishing you all success. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Our respected Dean, sir, Dr. T. R. Subramanya, authored a book on law related to hazardous substances published by Routledge Worldwide. It is indeed a moment of great pride for all of us here at CMR University School of Legal Studies to formally release this work of great significance amidst the august presence of our honored resource persons. I request Honorable Mr. Justice Ashok G. Nijagarnavar, Professor Dr. P. Ishwara Bhatt, Professor Dr. Sashikala Gurpur, and all the dignitaries on the dais to kindly release the book. Now I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Sashikala Gurpur ma'am to share a few words about the book. Respected uh, uh, Honorable Judge Sir, uh, my respected teacher Dr. Ishwar Bhatt, uh, my teacher like friend, guide and philosopher and currently the distinguished visiting faculty at our esteemed law school, Dr. Subramanya sir, and also who is a kind of Utsav Murti today because of doing something which the civilization and humankind will remember, and all the dear faculty colleagues and students. It's my great honor to stand before you and introduce this monumental work. Why do I call it as a monumental work? Once a famous author said that if you want to be remembered by posterity, you do either of the two things, either create a university or write a book. I think Dr. Subramanya, is in, he has his contribution in both the areas. If not creating a university, he is rejuvenating the university as the dean of this law school. But he has written a book on something which is very important for any civilization to thrive, which is related to uh, environmental law. All of us know Professor Subramanya. So when you when you discuss a book as students, you know, when you discuss a book, it's like discussing a, a piece of metal where we are trying to find the gold, uh, what percentage of gold, then only the metal has the value. So when you are reviewing a book, first you know where is the book coming from? Who is the author of the book? These days we have a lot of uh, people who, are, who have ghost authors who written, write columns for them, articles for them. But knowing Dr. Subramanya and his tapasya, of, or his life is like a tapasya or meditation in teaching, learning and improving the law. So uh, discussing the book is about first introducing the author. So Dr. Subramanya is very well known in academic circles as a person who is a walking encyclopedia on uh, international law. We have, I mean, international law teachers are a dying breed in India and uh, there are very few good law teachers. and. Uh, more, uh, fewer, uh, great law teachers. So, so Dr. Subramanya is one of those great law teachers whom every law school is delighted to invite. So, uh, within international law, if you ask any area, sir is able to speak with that kind of authenticity and command, which shows as a student how thoroughly he read the international law from the classic authors. But over the years with his PhD in JNU and with his uh, appointments in the international level in one of the most contentious areas in Bering, Sir developed his uh, practical expertise as well, not only theoretical, in environmental law. Now today I deem it as an honor because I hold the Jamone chair uh, on climate change law policy and management being uh, sponsored by European Union, which is, uh, which is uh, obtained after uh, a uh, lot of competition across the world. In the world, 170 applications were sifted to 
get 33, and out of 33, we hold one of them in India. The only one in India as far as uh, climate change law is concerned. And it wouldn't have been possible but for showing an expert like Dr. Subramanya on the advisory panel and his contribution when we were trying to find out what are the gaps in the curriculum in India as far as climate change is concerned. So, sir is an authority on this uh, subject, but what is most interesting about this monumental work is he does not begin with environmental law, he does not stop with environmental law. So, the title of the book, Hazardous Substances in India and the World, and then the three facets of legislation, framework and management. Now, if you look at the title itself, the very word hazardous substance, nobody will see it as a book on environmental law. One will see it as a book related to human existence, related to something which the trade is pushing to us, related to a time where you, are, you cannot look at law just as a static content in the legislation or in the authoritative sources of law, but as a speaking law, as a living law in terms of how it relates to, how it relates to our life, as a system to prevent injustice, as a system to correct issues which create imbalance in the framework of justice, um, and also as a kind of documentation of rights and also a documentation of what should be done if there are wrongs. This is how law is viewed. Uh, but looking at law only in that static, legislative, isolated, armchair exercise would not do much, much service to the study of law or to working with the law. So Dr. Subramanya has embarked on a journey where he has picked that area which relates to uh, human operation or human uh, activities which is relating to the area where law has remained far from being the ideal. So research begins from there where the reality is far from being the ideal. Therefore, this book captures that kind of a personality of the author, concerns of the author and concerns in that area. Now, if you ask me about this book, when you begin uh, living through the book, aside from uh, uh, the very color of the book, the cover which is in green, which gives you an indication that this is something related to nature, something related to environment, uh, which is our home, the ecosystem, but as you go inside, you will see the foreword by Justice Nazir. He gives a very good sentence. He says that this is the book which helps us in making informed decisions. And then it makes one to choose wisely. Now, who should make informed decisions? Who should choose wisely? Is it limited to judge alone? Justice Nazir's sentence is very, very important sentence because it at a time touches upon all the stakeholders in the uh, environment. Who are those stakeholders? It will be policymakers. It will be business enterprises like corporations. It will be people who are involved in uh, 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 implementing the law like the executive or it could be even the judges and lawyers who are arguing the case in this area. Therefore, what is very interesting is the way in which the idea of hazardous substance is introduced. It's a thumping introduction in my opinion. So the book has got these chapters which has a general introduction where there is a thumping introduction in terms of introducing what are hazardous substances. You wouldn't have imagined something like breast milk substitute could be hazardous substance. Something like what we deem as life-saving drug could be hazardous substance if it is something that is not acceptable in the state where it is manufactured or where the company's seat of incorporation or seat of control is located but it is trying to push to countries where the law has not banned those drugs. So those very drugs which are seen as therapeutic substances could become hazardous substance. That is the smartness of the author. It, it can come from only a uh, 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 perspective of a writer who is seeing it in what earlier Archimedes called standing outside the magnetic force of uh, you know, force of what we call as uh, mm, uh, uh, what is there. All of us could be at once assuming hazardous substance means poisonous substance. No. He does have poisonous substance within the definition of hazardous substance where he includes pesticides which has implication for agriculture, which has implication for food safety as well. So um, here if you see uh, the very uh, nature, kind, effect and global trade and shoring, offshoring stories of these substances is captured in the introduction where you have tables, where you have statistics which show the pattern of developed countries pushing such materials to the developing countries, 
uh, you know. And secondly, uh, it dwells, the book dwells on the global management policies regarding food, pesticide, pharma, and the waste. We used to talk about the transboundary management of hazardous waste or transboundary transporting of hazardous waste. So uh, the book talks about the emerging international order in that area, national management, regional management in the sense of laws and policies, not just laws, directives as well in European Union, in OECD countries, in uh, organization of African uni uh, unity. Now look at the comparison. When it comes to Europe, they are very green savvy. For example, uh, I, when I was doing my PhD on biodiversity law, I was looking at laws in the USA, I was looking at laws in Europe and looking at uh, the protest coming from so-called Global South, which has got Latin American, uh, African and Asian countries. It was the European discourses which was in favor of how we were thinking uh, uh, in terms of nature, in terms of conservation of nature. Uh, but on the other hand, we have Africa where uh, hazardous substances are absorbed in countries like Nigeria. So it cites those uh, statistics and uh, uh, examples which shows that corrupt administration, indifferent administration, missing consumer voices, public organizations, non-governmental protests can result in a country being the dumping site of such waste. It can result in a country as a receptive country, uh, as a receptive site or location of these hazardous materials, whether in the form of food material or in the form of drugs or medicines. Now, while discussing national management in India, sir, uh, beautifully captures all the legislative developments, which is very much in tune with the international uh, materials which he has captured, international conventions and treaties. But then he hints at bad management in terms of eyewash or what he calls as a lackadaisical approach to environmental impact assessment, whether it is in the establishment of uh, a business or establishment of a project or whether it is uh, in the manufacturing process. So a chapter on liability dimension, this is where it touches the global excellence in terms of the content of the book. How far <coughs> liability for producing hazardous material should be there? How far liability for preventing the hazardous impact of generic production should be there? And what are the dimensions in consumer law, which is the latest, and we have the latest Consumer Protection Act amendment. So where does it stand in terms of hazardous substance is what he highlights in his uh, penultimate chapter. And the last chapter is the concluding chapter, which has got many recommendations for reform of policy and law. What I thought was, this is the book in its uh, concluding chapter uh, has left many hypotheses for you, future researchers, in terms of uh, law reform, in terms of policy reform, in terms of uh, testing if the statement which he left inconclusive in the book, in terms of where the attention of law reform should be focused, whether it is really happening with these governments which have come on uh, uh, different lines. What he talks about uh, suggestively at the end of the book is uh, something that I really liked in terms of uh, uh, where the uh, reform focus should be and uh, how uh, the whole idea of management of hazardous uh, substances uh, in terms of not only environment but human safety, biosafety for example or food safety remains unaddressed and needs a lot of work to be done. Uh, he says in terms of sometimes party preferences, sometimes administrative preferences, sometimes due to corruption, sometimes due to lackadaisical nature of not taking things seriously. Because for us, uh, leading our day-to-day -day life, addressing our greed and need becomes more important than looking at the long-term impact of the environment, uh, on environment and on our own lives. So the post-Bhopal scenario which he is laying down, and uh, why uh, Bhopal uh, tragedy itself is uh, uh, a classic case of uh, India's uh, you know, uh, lackadaisical approach and international politics in bringing a dangerous uh, pesticide manufacturing, I mean pesticide ingredient, chemical manufacturing unit to India. And then going scot-free, uh, Michael Anderson being uh, taken uh, with the state protection, you know, just to cross the borders, are some of the realities which have been uh, beautifully responded to in terms of what changes happen and there is a subtle kind of sadness or lament which is captured in the book about the way in which it hasn't been still like this in the way it ought to have been. But the book also points out how the thought law development is being seen 
And all of you will agree the way the National Green Tribunals have been foisting fines after fines, irrespective of uh, who is the actor there. Like your own uh, Sri Sri has been, uh, Sri Sri Guruji has been in the centre of controversy, and now there is another Guruji who is going on a kind of campaign to protect nature, but uh, has got contradictions. Uh, which was challenged in the press conference recently. So in the light of all of those, for me, this book holds a lot of promise for future authors of environmental law or climate change related analytical dynamic dimensions and particularly for those who will work on hazardous substance. I don't know how many of you have been following these uh, developments in terms of India's uh, plastic uh, recycle kind of uh, units. And during COVID-19, the news was not receiving much of a uh, much of an importance or an analytical discussion when the I think a ster sterilite manufacturing unit in uh, Andhra Pradesh went out of control and people fell on the street being suffocated. So we have many such secretive kind of manufacturing units, processing units being established, which deal with hazardous substances which have been imported from abroad because such refineries and such reuse is not uh, something that is allowed under their law and the public is very alert and the information is open. So unless there is transparency in the dealing of, dealings of the government, critical voices among public emerging, scholars and he mentions about that, law institutions like us uh, being very alert and youth being uh, uh, responsive to these things and then the power of the social media and other being tapped towards this more than uh, courting and dating behaviors. If our social media power is unleashed for protecting the environment and preventing such damage to the environment, I'm sure that the aspirations of this book and the strong message of the book will be realized. And as it is said in the introduction, I would like to reiterate this, I mean in the foreword uh, and by the publisher's note as well, I would like to reiterate that this is the book which is a must read for every law student, every law reformer, every a person who is involved in uh, reform of uh, our lives and also a must read book for the future researchers in climate change law and environmental law. I congratulate uh, Professor Subramanya for making uh, such Although uh, I always say that people like us who go and speak in forums and sir is a wonderful speaker and a great teacher without referring single notes he talks, uh, drawing everything from his memory, not only in law but also uh, I have heard interesting historical, philosophical, literature uh, uh, citations. I mean, all of you who have been working with him, who are learning from him, with uh, stand by this statement from him. Uh, but sir, uh, th those isolated voices in the wilderness, like in Kannada, is Aranya Rodhan, uh, will not be remembered. But a book like this, with such perfection that you have brought to it, it with such critical input, it's not simply a book which captures information, but which gives a perspective. Tomorrow, if I am going to make a checklist for my researchers on one area in environmental law, in the line of dynamic dimension of climate uh, change law and in global comparison, this book gives me 20 checklist points. That is the contribution you have made. You have not only given a book and the information, you have given a methodology. So congratulations on that count here. Uh, meta, we call it as a meta-analytical approach. It is giving a, uh, giving a superior dimension to approach knowledge which is missing in law and it cannot be done by lawyers alone. It could be possible only by a scholar like you who has, like a boat, consumed all the facets of intellectual enterprise. So congratulations on that count. And I really envy the uh, privilege and fortune of CMR, a group of institutions for having a scholar like him on their fold and all of your students and teachers, definitely you have lots to gain. And all the best sir for your future endeavors. This is just, I know that I have captured the ocean in a teacup and I think you have captured an ocean in the teacup of your own possibilities of being a great author. So all the best and good luck. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much ma'am for that brief yet comprehensive overview of the book. I would now request Professor Dr. Ishwara Bhatt to kindly speak a few words about the book. Honorable Justice Ashoka Jagannath, Professor T.R. Subramanya, Professor Shashikala Gurupur, Praneshwar, 
faculty members and the students. First of all, uh, let me congratulate uh, Professor uh, uh, T.R. Subramanian for uh, uh, bringing out uh, this uh, valuable contribution to uh, the uh, whole uh, world of knowledge. He has uh, enriched uh, legal uh, knowledge. Uh, of course, uh, uh, he is known for uh, dedicated uh, work. Uh, I, whether it is a research or a, a teaching or a research guidance or a, any other type of uh, academic works he is known for uh, excellence. But uh, it is not possible to imitate his style of teaching at all. Uh, he would come without uh, uh, even a strip of a paper and uh, just on the basis of uh, memory he will uh, deliver uh, lectures. Uh, I treat him as uh, my elder brother. Uh, not only that uh, he was a uh, one year senior in our uh, uh, LLM program, but also for the reason that uh, I was uh, seeking guidance from him. And uh, his uh, mentor, uh, Professor Surendra, was also my teacher and we had uh, that kind of uh, intimate relations. Uh, for the as a researcher, uh, he was uh, uh, working in a very time-bound manner. I had that uh, personal experience, how in uh, uh, Calcutta, uh, he headed a uh, uh, research center and uh, produced a number of uh, research reports in a very timely manner, on the basis of a very in-depth discussion. It may be, it may be about an uh, executive magistrate, or about uh, various uh, other aspects. Of course, sir. Uh, at that time, I was uh, reminding him about uh, the work to be brought out. And uh, of course, he was uh, updating this particular work because uh, this work was uh, prepared perhaps in the uh, early 1990s. Uh, but uh, a lot of developments had taken place. And uh, uh, the domestic law ought to be included. Perhaps uh, the original thesis uh, had uh, more focus on international law and uh, he wanted to supplement it uh, through the Indian law. That is why legislation, framework and management, all these aspects have been included. And uh, this book uh, is a uh, very comprehensive piece of uh, uh, work. Uh, it uh, uh, has a actually uh, brought out uh, new ideas and the way in which uh, he focuses on uh, various uh, issues and uh, analyzes points out how uh, through such a generation of knowledge a kind of a reform is to be brought out of course in a uh, Indian perspective Knowledge is not an end by itself. Knowledge, knowledge is a means for a welfare. It is a means for a justice. It is a means for a empowerment. From a, that angle, the book has a, made a, a big contribution. The gap in the field of a, a analysis of a law related to hazardous substances has been a filled up by very able uh, work done by Professor T.R. Subramanya. For uh, any author, reception of the book and uh, uh, following of that book or uh, interaction, all these things uh, count and uh, uh, the pleasure that is, uh, the author has is uh, mainly on the basis of uh, that kind of uh, social acceptance of uh, his work and uh, I hope that uh, the academic community will uh, wholeheartedly accept uh, this uh, book because uh, it has an uh, excellent uh, contribution. The uh, printer uh, form in which uh, it is uh, brought out is uh, uh, good, it is excellent and uh, uh, of course uh, the 
academic community, I hope, uh, will uh, wholeheartedly accept uh, this book by Professor T.R. Subramanian. And uh, uh, in future also, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Professor Subramanian will be contributing in the form of uh, these types of uh, works and uh, end the legal knowledge system. With this, uh, uh, let me once again uh, wish uh, uh, all the best to Professor Subramanian. Uh, writing a book is uh, uh, quite an uh, industrious uh, work. I personally have that uh, experience that uh, uh, it uh, requires a lot of uh, attention, correcting of footnotes, authentic uh, and uh, uh, checking about uh, uh, about uh, authenticity and uh, uh, proof reading and so many other things. Of course, when it is uh, brought out by Rutledge, uh, which is uh, known for a uh, quality of production, yes, they have ensured that uh, it is uh, free from defects and uh, it is uh, conforming to all the standards of uh, excellent uh, publication. Uh, again, let me wish uh, all the best to Professor Sobhoni. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. I would now request Honorable Mr. Justice Ashok G. Nijagarnavar, sir, to kindly deliver the inaugural address on sedition laws. President of this uh, August uh, gathering, Professor T. Asubramanya, my teacher, and another great teacher who also taught me at the State of Royal University of College, Professor Ishar Bhatt, Madam Gurupur, Mr. Pranesh Honorable members of teaching faculty and management of this prestigious college, distinguished invitees and my dear friends. First of all, uh, this is some sort of a Herculean task for me to speak before <laughs> two great teachers that were on a legal subject like this. Basically, in fact, I'm already proud of my teacher who has written this book in an international standards. And then today, I was really wondering when my teacher asked me to speak on sedition law. As far as the inaugural part of this gathering is concerned, I'm really <laughs> thrilled and I deem it a privilege to take part in this uh, August gathering, especially a seminar on recent trends on constitutional law. At one point of time, I thought of speaking like a common man, having two views. Before uh, touching upon the subject, I always think that uh, on several occasions, the Honorable Supreme Court has uh, repeatedly said that always the factual and the societal reality and the constantly changing uh, according to the challenges faced by the all, sets, all sections of the society in this country leads to formation of new trends in law. And law institutions like this, especially the CMR University, which is one of the prestigious institution, law institution in this country, has endeavored to equip the students or the mold the, the younger minds in teaching the developing trends and giving an the necessary information how they should move around, move forward in their uh, legal field. 
this is very much required. I really, I'm really grateful to this institution for having done this human service this of this kind for uh, developing the intellectual acumen of the students. Then, uh, because of the time constraint, I'd like to cut short a few of my thoughts. When, it, uh, when I said that I was really wondering why my teacher asked me to speak on the on a subject like sedition law, again at the cost of repetition, I'm saying that I have got two views, like a, one as a common man, one as an intellectual person belonging to an intellectual class. In a country having 100 and more than 134 crores population, hardly 0.001% thinks about this sedition law. You ask the rest of the people, they do not know what is sedition, what is sedition law, why they are, good, why they are facing problems. It's hardly few intellectual class, they are being hauled up or sometimes there are allegations that they are being hauled up for this sedition law and there is no justification as such. Therefore, few petitions have been filed with the Honorable Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the law. When again coming to the, the practical aspect how the sedition law is being practiced. In older days, pre-independence era, though this law was, uh, this, uh, especially this section 124A, the sedition law came into existence, came into force in 1870, though it was formulated prior to that 1978 by Lord Mapale. Thereafter, in 1891, the first case was tried before the Calcutta High Court. Thereafter, from 1897 to 1908, thrice Bal Gangadhar Tilak was tried and convicted once for uh, making a speech in a Ganesh festival, which according to Britishers, that led to killing of two Britishers, British office officials. Thereafter, for publishing one article in Kesari, against uh, the establishment. Thereafter, even in 1920, 1922, I believe, oh, Mahatma Gandhi was convicted for uh, writing some articles against the establishment in his uh, daily newspaper, something like Young India, and he was convicted for six years. Thereafter, in 1949, 1950, 51, some judgments came. Finally, in 1962, the constitutionality of this sedition law was uh, taken up by a five judges committee or five judges bench and uh, held uh, that uh, section 124 is 24A is constitutional. But the Chief Justice B.P. Sina made certain remarks that clarified that any statement made against the government cannot be seditious or sedition, can't be termed as sedition. It's only those kind of hate speeches or anything that is act done, you all must have read section 124 ACPC, any visible acts, spoken rather, visible representation by science, etc, etc, which incites the violence, which provokes the people to overthrow the government. Such kind of activities alone can be considered as sedition, not other acts. And uh, you see the recent trends like uh, uh, last year in the month of February I believe, one girl uh, shouted such slogan. She did not shout against India but she made some slogan praising some other country. Likewise, there was uh, another incident in a place called Bidar, a far-off district in Karnataka. 
in protest of some CAA, something of that sort. And there were some other cases, some people protested in Kashmir. They were all booked under Section 124A suggestion. So what really matters is whether any statement made by those persons had any intention to overthrow the government or could it be said that only a, a hate speech which provoked a, which was anti-national could it be termed as an offence under sedition these are all to be matter these are all the matters to be really uh, mind boggling That is why after 1962, few other judgments were also in, uh, in one of the matters, uh, a petition filed by Vinod Dua, uh, a journalist, the Honorable Supreme Court said uh, uh, the content of uh, the article written by him against the government cannot be termed as sedition. Till then, the Supreme Court constituted a committee, but by rejecting the plea of other claim, for the petition for framing the screening committee, but the Supreme Court ordered for constituting a committee. How many cases of this kind have been booked against the journalists? Thereafter, in the year 1921 to 2021, nine petitions were filed by different activists, journalists, politicians. Um, they were all club and all. Chief Justice, President Chief Justice of India, Honorable Justice N.V. Ramana, I mean, it was the three judges bench, they have passed an order uh, for referring the matter to the higher bench. But meanwhile, the central government filed an affidavit before the court, stating that they are going to reconsider this bill. I mean, I beg your pardon, this sedition law, whether it is to be repealed or it is to be redefined. At this juncture, though it is uh, a subject pertaining to criminal law, some part of it refers to constitutional law. Itself. It mainly deals with Article 19.1a of the Constitution. A right to free speech. Earlier, there was, uh, even according to the Supreme Court, there was a narrow, narrow construction. And th those prior to pro independence, those British judges tried to bring within the ambit of sedition even some statements made in anticipation which are not likely to create any violence. That was the notion. But gradual transformation has taken place. Now in 1962 and thereafter, in the subsequent judgments, the Supreme Court is of the view that not all statements that are made against the state can be termed as sedition. In a country like ours, we should have a vibrant democracy by exercising our right of free speech. Any constructive statement made for the welfare of the state cannot be termed as sedition. Because it is in the interest of the nation those statements are being done. Every person has got, every citizen has got a right to speak against the policies of the government. They can't be termed as a statement to overthrow the government or the government established by law. We have got to make a fine distinction of what kind of statements have been done. Mechanically, the law enforcing machineries cannot book the people for a sedition law. Those law enforcing machineries uh, 
should not be at the whims and fancies of the political parties, take law into their hands and harass the people who have come with some new creative ideas for welfare of the nation. But at the same time, the Honorable Supreme Court said that right to speech is not an absolute right. There are some reasonable restrictions for that. It is for us, it is for the courts, it is not only for the courts sometimes. Because, you know, all problems are being shifted to the courts. We are being uh, put on hold and we are compelled to pass judgments interpreting the constitution and, was, and even the people or some class of people don't uh, respect the word is given by the courts, higher, the highest courts. That creates a problem in the society. That is why considering all these things in the year 2018, the law commission came up with some ideas. They have suggested certain reforms. In, uh, they have given some uh, way forward how this uh, the legislature has to make the or either to redefine the law or to wipe out this sedition law because there are other kinds of penal laws which take care of uh, the problems. Suppose uh, section 153A and 153B of uh, Indian Penal Code is there. You know what is 153A and 153B? People who commit uh, the wrongful acts of this public tranquility or in the public places. In those matters, you need not necessarily bring all those persons with the ambit of one section 124A IPC, sedition law. There are certain other parameters to decide whether a person who has committed the wrongful act can be charged for an offence under section 124A IPC. Then, uh, since the Law Commission of India has framed these uh, rules and guidelines as a way forward as to what is to be done with section 124A sedition, I fully endorse with this uh, the guidelines which have been given by the Law Commission of India which is headed by the, the former judge of the Honorable Supreme Court. I do not want to, I do not venture to order all, all these uh, points because uh, uh, after consulting the all stakeholders, these guidelines have been prepared as to whether uh, the present sedition law holds good for the society or not. In a, and as we all know, Ten years back, the United Kingdom uh, abolished or repealed uh, Section 124A. Still, some laws of sedition are there in the United States and uh, United, uh, uh, beg your pardon, Australia and some other countries. Even after 70 years, we are still uh, we are still retained this Section 124A sedition law in our statute books. But there is a feeling from some intellectual class, sometimes much hype is being created, that these, this law, sedition law, will certainly affect the right to speech, a fundamental right of the citizens, which is not in the interest of the nation. This for you all to have a seminar on this kind of uh, topics also so that you can have a meaningful interaction. <coughs> These law institutions are there to create sometimes the public opinion in a structured manner. We can't go to street and shout slogans 
or damage properties for to draw the attention of the government. We are here to do everything systematically to bring a proper law for our self-administration. It is we the people who have we are the masters of this, you know, this nation. When we collectively do something meaningful, it will definitely help the interest of the nation. At this juncture, I, had, I do not want to add more because of the time constraint. I thank the organizers and my teachers for giving me an opportunity to share my few of my ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening words. I would now like to invite our respected Dean, Professor Dr. T. R. Subramanya, to deliver the presidential address. Honorable <laughs> Justice Nagranavar, former Judge High Court of Karnataka, and the sitting member of the Karnataka State Law Commission, Professor Ishwar Bhatt, Professor Gurupur, and Professor Praneshwaran, and respected teachers, distinguished students who have registered for the seminar, and everyone who is present. Justice Nijayanava spoke like a realist because Article 19.1 is a precious article and everyone has the freedom of expression. But then there are certain grey areas and in these grey areas the expression is limited. The expression is limited because it will threaten the integrity and the sovereignty of the country. And ultimately it will lead to dismemberment. It is here the government as well as the court should be cautious. And the court has been acting very cautiously. Thank you sir for your wonderful speech, putting the data chrono chronologically and examining the relevant cases which are part of the problem of the law of sedition. I also thank Professor Gurupur for speaking so high about the book. Now, I just only two sentences I will add without wasting time. This was originally a PhD thesis which I submitted at the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And the duration of the thesis was between 1990 to 1993. Prior to that, I had done my MPhil. Soon after doing the MPhil, I registered for the PhD course. In the MPhil course, I had worked on hazardous waste. And I had, this was a blessing of God perhaps, Professor Ramutullah Khan. Professor Ramatullah Khan was the first chair professor of international, in the international environmental law in this country. The government of India had created two chairs at JNU, especially in the School of International Studies. One in the area of environmental law and other one in the area of space law. Professor V. S. Mani, who was legal advisor to the island of Nauru, became the professor of space law. and. Professor Ramatullah Khan was a professor of international law, became professor of environmental law. So this person was a combination of both international law as well as environmental law. He was a legal advisor to the government of Iran as well. In the award of compensation cases, he has written a book on that. So it is here, uh, especially in the Friday seminars, we used to get uh, the immense exposure which these scholars had. So when I completed my dissertation, it was supposed to be the best presentation. People were saying, and I have the writing also with me. No one uh, had written earlier a dissertation of that time. Then he's, he just called me, Subramanian, he said, hazardous waste is waste now. It's over. 
Now ship to substances. To hazardous substances. I know I happen to be essentially a student of arts, a very good student of history, and to a certain extent literature also. Then what is this substance? I have to study from the beginning. But then in three years, because I had an access to wonderful materials, and which he used to get from the Max Planck, which he used to share with every research student, and it had to be given very safely to him back. So that is where we worked and we were able to finish before time. And although the mandatory period of three years, I submitted in two and a half years. And then I, I left as advisor to the Kingdom of Bahrain. That is one part of the story. Now what has happened was, soon after the Vaiva got over, Ramadhava Khan was interested to get the thesis published, which nobody does. And he called the sage publisher, it was one of the Sage and Vikas were the two important publishers, he called both of them because he had an access to them, because one of his books was published by Vikas. And both of them had taken the PhD thesis and after two days returned. They said it is too technical, we cannot mark it. We cannot sell one copy of this book. So in the meanwhile, no, I was busy in packing my remember, luggage to go to Bahrain. So I came back after 80 years, then it was forgotten. Because I remember life was a struggle like that. I was in Salgaon course, then I came to Bangalore, then I became a professor, and the rest is history. What has happened was when I completed my tenure as vice chancellor, I had to go, as Professor Butt has pointed out, I was heading a center on public policy. And when I started working, remember, we used to announce for uh, what we call internship. And at times we used to get 20, 30 internees there, very good students. And I found two of them and just I asked, give the list, these are the things which I require and you will be given a certificate, can you collect these materials? And they brought, it was only minus. The task was, I had to edit again and go through again, put the footnote again and I had to ask somebody from Delhi and from the United Nations Institute of Research at the United Nations office and we collected all the materials which were required and ultimately the thesis was ready. Then I thought of whom to send and someone said who had written in my own center there was a person said he had published a book from abroad and why don't you send because well, it is very good material outstanding, you know where you will find these materials. And then I sent it and they took one and a half years to give the approval. And I was about to get it published from somewhere. Then they told, told us that we have sent it to certain people. One is the content, the second one is the marketability. And they have such people in their, remember, uh, uh, office, office means they engage them. And they said it's a very good book. And then the book came out. And even in the last minute, a lot of editing was required, which Professor Bhatt knows we also, I have also learnt a bit of it. And the book came out. So the rest is history. Now, I thank uh, Madam Shishkala Gurur for uh, making such a, a wonderful study of the book itself and speaking to you. And uh, uh, I never thought. These are the things which are there, although it is written. When you started saying, I started recollecting. Yes. And of course, few of it are remember written where? In the year 1993, 94. And at least one third to 40% of the material which I have collected had to be deleted. Because at that time, as Madam pointed out, I had not given importance to the state of India. Only a few legislations, uh, the Environment Protection Act and a few of them had it. It was included. But then after the passing of the Environment Protection Act, remember, the, the development of the law in the area of environment is stupendous. And it is huge. Perhaps no other country, no other developing country has enacted so many laws as we have done. All of, all of them relating to the substance that had to be put and that had to be analyzed critically. That is where the book is. I also thank uh, <laughs> Professor Ishara uh, for giving a practical uh, uh, approach to, to the book 
and thank Praneshwaran and everyone. Once again, with best wishes to all of you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your encouraging thoughts with us. I would like to invite our beloved professor, Srinidhi K.R., to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, it is my absolute privilege to be proposing a vote of thanks on this occasion today. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Honorable Mr. Justice Ashok Thinaji uh, for having kindly accepted our invitation on such short notice and having delivered that succinct yet uh, uh, highly uh, researched rendering about uh, sedition laws in India. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I now request our uh, Dean, Dr. P. S. Subramanian, to kindly present uh, Justice Nizekanavar uh, with a token of our uh, gratitude. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would also like to express my gratitude for uh, our honored resource person, Professor Dr. Ishwar Bhatt, uh, who has traveled here all the way from Mysore early in the morning. Uh, uh, he will shortly be uh, delivering his uh, session on uh, uh, constitutional interpretation very soon. Uh, I thank you in advance for that, sir. And thank you also for your kind comments on the books, uh, on the book that was released today. Uh, I would like to further thank Professor Dr. Shashikala Gurpur. Uh, Ma'am is a, a Fulbright Scholar, Ajin Mune, Chair Professor, Director of SLS Pune and Dean uh, of Symbiosis International University in Pune. And uh, Ma'am has always been a great patron of all our events that we've had at CMRU School of Legal Studies. Uh, and she's delivered some excellent, excellent talks and lectures which has enriched all our knowledge, uh, you know, in, in the past. Uh, and she has kindly agreed to do so again today. She will be uh, uh, talking in the second session on the relevance of uh, directive principles on law and policy, constitutional governance. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I would further like to thank our Dean, Professor Dr. T.R. Subramanian, who is the force behind all of these great academic and research initiatives that are taking place in the School of Legal Studies. Uh, he's been constantly engaged in planning one activity after the other, keeping us all on our toes, uh, but enriching us, uh, you know, in the process. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and congratulations on the release of the book, sir. Uh, I would further like to thank our management, which is, uh, you know, a constant source of encouragement for all such activities and never say no to any of the events that we have proposed and you know it, it is because of that we have one seminar uh, every other day uh, you know much to the uh, uh, you know complaint of our <laughs> students uh, so many guest lectures uh, I would like to thank the administration of the university including our vice chancellor uh, our registrar Dr. R. Praveen who was uh, here with us a while ago he had to leave uh, on some urgent business our dean academics and all the other functionaries of the university. Uh, I would uh, be remiss if I do not thank our director, Dr. Vijay Praneswara, who has been, you know, he is like a pillar standing there supporting us in all these initiatives, the force uh, uh, behind the scenes, working, uh, you know, putting strings, arranging, organizing things, you know, setting things in order. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would like, like to thank the members of the academic uh, uh, events coordination committee, Professor Adra, Professor Nidhi and Professor Parul uh, and Professor Vignesh who have been uh, working tirelessly from the last two days in organizing this event. Uh, and uh, special thanks to Professor uh, Ramga uh, who is going to be feeding us today, by the way. <laughs> she is in charge of the food. Uh, Participants and students, we have participants from, you know, from uh, distant parts of the country uh, as well as from universities and schools uh, in Bangalore and we also have our own students who have registered here, students of LLM Constitutional Law of LLP and other programs as well. Uh, thank you all for registering and for attending, for taking the uh, event further. And last but not the least, thank you Shruti for being such a wonderful MC. Thank you all. Have a very good morning.